In a video that's called A Shadow of Things to Come, our friends from 119 Ministries take a look at this passage from Colossians 2. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. This passage is a pretty common target of Hebrew Roots Movement organizations like 119 Ministries because it really presents a pretty big challenge to their belief that the law of Moses is still binding. And of course, in this video, uh, 119 Ministries wants to reject the traditional Christian interpretation of this passage in favor of one of their own. And I say good for them to test everything. I think that's great. Iron sharpens iron, right? And I have to give credit to 119 Ministries too because they do a really good job uh, when they put out videos, they do a good job of making it easy to find and download not only the videos, but transcripts of the videos, which really shows their commitment to their core ethic of test everything. And I think that's commendable. So today we're going to honor their culture and we're going to test their teaching on this passage in Colossians 2. And by the way, for some reason, 119 Ministries just never lets you know the name of the teachers in their videos. They're all anonymous. So I'm just going to refer to the teacher in the video as 119. Uh, no offense intended, I just don't know the guy's name. So in this video, uh, 119 does a good job of correctly framing the traditional Christian interpretation of this passage. And they even offer a quote from John MacArthur that says, Don't let anybody hold you to the Sabbath. It was part of the system that included the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices. It's gone. It was only the shadow, not the substance. Paul is saying, you no longer need the shadow, you have the substance. The traditional Christian interpretation of this passage is that Paul was writing to the church at Colossae to tell them, and by extension us, not to let anyone judge us as to whether or not we keep those Jewish traditions. But of course, this is where 119 wants to present a challenge, and this is what they say. Is that really what Paul is saying in Colossians? Does he declare commands like the Sabbath and festivals to be irrelevant now that Messiah has come? That seems unlikely for a couple of reasons. And then in this video, he proceeds to offer two reasons why they reject the traditional Christian interpretation of this passage. So let's test their two reasons. Here's their first reason in their own words. First, such an interpretation doesn't fit with the broader biblical witness of Paul's perspective on these commandments. For instance, throughout the New Testament, we see that Paul regularly attended and participated in the synagogue services on the Sabbath. So he goes on to list additional examples in Scripture of Paul keeping the Jewish traditions, and then he suggests this. Based on Paul's behavior and teaching elsewhere in Scripture, it's difficult to imagine him thinking that these parts of the Torah became irrelevant in light of the Messiah's coming. Instead, these examples of Paul observing and teaching these commandments are what we would expect if he believed they were still important. One little side note here that I found interesting is that in this video, they refer to the Torah commandments with sort of equivocal statements like if it's relevant or if it's important, rather than talking about if it's required. Make of that what you will. So reason number one for rejecting the traditional interpretation of these two verses, verses 16 and 17, is that in his mind, they uh, don't match Paul's behavior and teachings throughout the rest of the New Testament. In other words, he's saying Paul is keeping the Jewish commandments everywhere else in the New Testament, so, so it doesn't make sense that here in Colossians 2, he would then be teaching that those commandments are just a shadow of things to come. So this brings up a simple principle that's missing from the many 119 Ministries videos that I've seen. Um, and it's a simple principle that really lays to rest this whole uh, larger argument that we hear from Hebrew roots movements and Torahists that says that basically because we see Jesus and Paul and the apostles and, and the disciples in the New Testament uh, keeping and observing the Jewish traditions, that therefore it must mean that the law of Moses is still binding. But the principle they're missing is this, permitted but not required. So the commandments that God gave to Israel under the Sinai covenant are today under the new covenant, permitted but not required. They're allowed, but they're not mandatory. So if Paul or any Jewish believer wants to keep Shabbat or they want to keep the, the dietary restrictions or celebrate Yom Kippur, they're free to do so. But under the new covenant, they're not required to do that. So the passages in the New Testament where we see Paul or the apostles 
keeping those Jewish traditions, those are descriptive passages rather than prescriptive. They're not telling us what to do. They're telling us what happened. And so we see Paul, yes, like, the, like we saw in the 119 video, we see Paul going to the synagogue on Sabbath. But what we don't see is Paul or Jesus or any of the apostles saying, see to it that you go to the synagogue every Sabbath. 119 wants to teach us that Paul kept those traditions because he was still under the law of Moses. But that conclusion would actually clash with what Paul taught about the law in this book and the, and the rest of the New Testament. So let me suggest two different and, and I think stronger reasons that Paul kept those traditions. And these are reasons that actually align with the New Testament's teachings. And those two reasons are tradition and unity. Remember that the dietary restrictions and the feasts and so on began as commandments for Israel. They were required in the law of Moses. And because of that, they became foundational to Jewish life and Jewish tradition. And then when Jesus came and through his blood, he brought in the new covenant, uh, those things stopped being required. Jesus had fulfilled the law of Moses and the Sinai covenant had become obsolete. And that's not my words. Check out Hebrews 8. So these traditions were deeply ingrained in Jewish culture and Jewish life. And Paul, as a Jew, it would have felt weird for him and odd for him to suddenly not keep them. It's like the year that, that my wife and I were both musicians and we went on a tour, a Christmas tour in Norway. So all of November, we were getting ready for the tour and we're here in the States and we, you know, you get exposed to all the stuff that's happening pre Thanksgiving, right? You're hearing about the Black Friday sales and there's uh, coupons on Turkey and there's TV specials and all that. And you're kind of getting caught up in that. So then we went to Norway and we were there on actually Thanksgiving with our daughters with us. Um, and in Norway, they don't celebrate Thanksgiving. So we show up and it felt weird and odd that no one was doing anything. So we ended up keeping the American tradition and having our own little family Thanksgiving dinner while we were over there just because it felt weird not to do it. Of course, that's a pretty simple analogy since Thanksgiving to an American pales compared to what the law of Moses would have meant to a Jew. But that's one of the reasons that Paul kept those Jewish traditions. It was just in his cultural DNA. And the second reason that he kept the traditions was because of unity. Paul was all about unity. In fact, we see this taught all throughout the New Testament. Paul is constantly and continually promoting unity. Things like don't cause your brother to stumble, um, especially between Jews and Gentiles. So it makes complete sense that Paul would continue keeping those Jewish traditions because they were permitted but not required. And he wanted to model that for his fellow Jews and, and for Jewish believers today, that they don't need, need to leave their Jewish behind in order to follow Jesus. So contrary to what 119 claims in their first objection, interpreting this passage, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, as indicating that the observance of those things was no longer required actually does match Paul's behavior and teaching throughout the New Testament. Here's the second reason that 119 rejects the passage we're looking at. Second, the false teaching Paul addresses in Colossians is characterized as, quote, according to human tradition. It is, quote, according to human precepts and teachings. That description does not seem to apply to the Sabbath, festivals, and dietary laws. Those things were not human teachings. They were commanded by God. Okay, so there's some stuff here where we can agree with our friends at 119. So first of all, we can agree that those commandments were not man-made, but they were given by God to Israel. And secondly, we can also agree that the false teachings in Colossae that Paul was addressing were characterized as human teachings. But that's not all they were. Those false teachings were also Jewish in nature, and they specifically addressed Jewish traditions. So before we jump into these two verses, let's take a step back and try to get some context here. So I'm going to kind of give us a flyover of Colossians 2 as a whole, and I'll do this pretty quickly. So I would encourage you to pause the video and go read Colossians 2 for yourself so you can see the larger context that we're talking about. The book of Colossians is actually a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Um, and one of the reasons, if not the primary reason, was to try to refute this heretical teaching, sometimes called the Colossians heresy. Uh, there were false teachers in the church that were promoting bad doctrine. Okay, so chapter two opens with Paul wanting to encourage the church. He, he, wants to, he wants to encourage their hearts and help them reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding of, of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And here Paul's expressing his desire 
for their wholeness and, and assurance and faith. And he reminds them that all wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. And why does he say that? Well, right here in verse 4, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Or some translations say arguments that sound reasonable or fine-sounding arguments. So Paul is beginning here now to address the false teachings in that church. And then in verses 6 and 7, he again encourages the church to, to walk with Jesus and remain rooted and, and built up in him and established in the faith just as they were taught. Uh, he also reminds them to, to be giving thanks constantly. That's, that's another one of Paul's grand themes that we see throughout his writings is this idea of thankfulness. And then he turns really to the argument here. In verse 8, Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So here comes Paul's warning, and Paul is urging the church in Colossae to be diligent and on guard against the false teachers that are in their midst. And that brings up the question, what was this false teaching that we're dealing with? And we're not actually told directly. Re reading this letter is a little bit like getting one half of a telephone conversation, right? We can, we can get enough information to kind of get an idea what Paul's talking about, but we aren't given the exact parameters of, of the heresy. But here in verse 8, we can actually gather four things. First of all, it's a deceitful philosophy or worldview, so it's a false worldview. It has to do with human tradition. Uh, it has to do with elemental spirits, or some translations render that uh, elementary principles or the rudiments of the world. And then it's not in alignment with Christ. So then in verses 9 through 15, um, over against this heresy being taught, Paul is now reminding the church who Christ is and what he's done for them. So he reminds the church that first, you know, Jesus is divine. He's the head over every power and authority. So he's reminding them of the supremacy of Jesus over these false teachings that they're hearing. And then Paul mentions circumcision, which gives us another clue to the nature of the heresy, because uh, circumcision was a Jewish thing. It was something God gave as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, you know, back in Genesis 17. Um, this sort of suggests that the false teachings were Jewish in nature. But Paul talks about circumcision in a completely new way here. So he's not talking about the physical version required under the Jewish law. He's actually referring to a circumcision made without hands. So it's a, it's a spiritual circumcision of Christ, right? This would have been associated with uh, the circumcision of the heart, which is that inward change that's mentioned uh, in several places in the Jewish scriptures. And then he describes the church at Colossae as having been dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, here in verse 13. And that tells us that the church was made up primarily of Gentiles, right, who were uncircumcised in the flesh. But then he says, God made us alive. And here he kind of changes to the plural, right? He's indicating us. So uh, he's now referring to all believers in Jesus, both Jew and Gentile. You know, God forgave all our trespasses by canceling our record of debt through the work on the cross. And then more than that, Paul is saying that Jesus' work on the cross also disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. So once again, Paul's underscoring Jesus' supremacy over the rulers and authorities and false teachers that the church was dealing with. And that brings us up to the verses in question today, what we're looking at. So to recap really quickly, Paul is basically saying to the church at Colossae, hey, keep trusting in the gospel you were given. Uh, don't forget how superior Jesus is over any other teaching. Um, don't forget who you are in him. You've been spiritually circumcised. You've been brought to new life through baptism. Your record of debt has been canceled by Jesus' work on the cross. And then, therefore, and let's pick it up at verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So those are our two verses. And verse 16 here, again, reveals the Jewish nature of the false teachings that were happening. In fact, it indicates, I think, that the false teachers were most likely Jewish themselves, because they're talking specifically here about traditions that would be exclusive to the Jewish world. But before we dig in deeper, let's, let's keep moving. Let's finish up on Paul's argument here. So, so in verse 18, we get some more insight into the false teachings that were going on. So we learn that they also had to do with asceticism 
and with the worship of angels. And then in verse 19, we again see how these false teachings were not based in Christ. And then verse 20, Paul's saying that you died to the elemental spirits of the world. So why are you submitting to these worldly regulations? And then in 21, he says, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which this seems to be sort of referring to some sort of purity or dietary laws that were being imposed by these false teachers, which again underscores the idea that whatever this body of incorrect teaching was, it certainly had a Jewish flavor to it. And then this chapter closes with Paul saying that, you know, these false teachings, hey, they might sound convincing, but ultimately they're futile because they don't address the root of the problem, which is sin. So from here, Paul moves on in chapter three to talking to the church about putting on the new self and about, about seeking things that are from above where Christ is. So with that larger context, let's circle back around now and take a look at verses 16 and 17. Okay, so verse 16 says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So the criteria that we see listed here, it corresponds with Jewish practices like food laws and, and calendar observances. And Paul's saying, hey, don't let anyone judge you about these things. And then he adds in verse 17 that those things, those, those Jewish practices are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So what are we looking at? The, the false teachers were apparently judging the church regarding these Jewish practices, but judging them in what way? Here, here's what 119 concludes. Paul does not state that the commandments are invalid. He states that the judgment of these false teachers is invalid. A better understanding, which is consistent with the context, is that the Colossian believers are not to accept judgment from these false teachers regarding how to observe these commandments. So 119 wants to frame Paul's statement here in verse 16 as opposing a false teaching about how to observe the Jewish practices, right? They're claiming that the, the church was observing those practices in one way, but they were being judged for that. And presumably the false teachers wanted them to observe those practices in a different way. So to 119, these verses aren't a matter of whether or not we should keep the practices, but rather how we should keep those practices. So therefore, here's what they conclude. In other words, proper observance of these Torah commands was not the problem in Colossians. The problem was that false teachers had mixed things like the Sabbath and festivals with their mystical teachings. Paul's admonition to the Colossian believers then is not to accept judgment on these matters from these false teachers. So for clarity, let me just recap. In the traditional Christian interpretation of verse 16, Paul's saying, hey, don't let anyone judge you if or, or whether or not you keep those commandments. But 119 wants to interpret the verse to say, hey, don't let anyone judge how you keep those commandments. So 119 is operating from a position of no matter what, you do have to keep the commandments. However, if we look at verse 17 and the analogy that Paul uses there, it sheds some light on what verse 16 actually means. So here in verse 17, he says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So these commandments are a shadow. They're not the substance. The substance is Jesus. He's the real thing. He's the real deal. So what does this contrast mean? So the way Paul phrases it, a shadow of the things to come, tells us there's a chronology to the analogy, right? There's a time element, so it's more like a foreshadowing. It's kind of like uh, if we see a shadow telling us that someone's coming down the hallway towards us, and then when Jesus came, it's like that person who was casting the shadow then stepped into the room and the real thing was here. There's also a sense of, of value or priority in this analogy. The shadow isn't the substance, it's just a symbol or a shape or a, a representation of the substance, right? The substance is the real thing, and that real thing is Jesus. And if you think about it, if you press it a little further, shadows are transient. They, they don't last forever, and you only see them depending on when the conditions are right. But the real thing, in this case, the substance, Jesus himself, lasts forever. There's also this idea uh, in the use of the words shadow and substance of contrasting the, the incomplete or shadowy former obligations with the fullness of Christ. In other words, God instituted the dietary laws and the holy days as a sort of foreshadowing of the coming reconciliation in the Messiah. That brings us back to the question, 
In what way were these Jewish false teachers judging the church on these practices? Now, 119 wants to suggest that these false teachers were essentially saying, hey, church, stop observing those practices in the traditional Jewish way. You need to mix in all our cool new mystical teachings. They were giving the church grief about how they were keeping the commandments. So in the 119 interpretation of this verse, Paul's essentially telling the church, hey, don't let them judge you. You go ahead and observe those commandments in the traditional Jewish way. However, at least three problems jump out at me if we want to interpret verse 16 to be talking about how the commandments should be kept. First, there's no direct indication in the text itself or in the larger context that Paul's comments here are aimed at how the commandments should be kept. Second, remember that this is primarily a Gentile church. And as we saw at the Jerusalem Council, which we can read about in Acts 15, 1 through 29, it was decided that the Gentiles don't need to keep all the dietary restrictions. They don't need to keep the feasts and the festivals and the new moons and the Sabbath. They were given just four restrictions. So why would Paul contradict himself here in Colossians? Third, if this was what Paul was talking about in verse 16, why would he complete his thought, his statement, by pointing out that the commandments were shadows of things to come? Calling the commandments shadows seems to contradict their importance and their weightiness. If that's what Paul meant, then you would think he would follow up in verse 17 with a statement something like, keep those commandments in the traditional Jewish way because they were commanded by God, or because they lead to life, or something solid like that. Instead, Paul describes these commandments as shadows, as foreshadowing of Christ. And remember, at this time that Paul wrote this letter, Jesus had already come. He had already lived out his earthly ministry. He had been crucified. He had been resurrected and ascended to heaven. Those were all past events at the time Paul wrote this letter. How does it make sense for Paul to then say, hey, you keep those commandments in the traditional Jewish way because they're going to point us to Jesus? Didn't Jesus already show up? So the traditional Christian interpretation of this passage makes a lot more sense. It fits more seamlessly into the flow of Paul's thought here in Colossians 2, and it also aligns more consistently with the teachings throughout the New Testament. So a better interpretation of verse 16 and 17 would be, Hey, Gentile church, don't let those false teachers judge you as to whether or not you keep the commandments, because they were just a foreshadowing of Christ who has come and fulfilled them. Just like we read in Romans 10.4, in Galatians 3.24, in Hebrews 10.1, Paul here in Colossians 2 is reiterating that the law ultimately points to Christ. The shadow is not the substance. It only points us to the substance. So what Paul is telling the church in Colossae, and by extension he's telling all believers today, is hey, don't let people judge you as to whether or not you want to keep those Jewish practices. In other words, they're permitted but not required. Thanks for watching. Shalom.